Hello everyone and welcome to STEM Fest 2015. My name is Bradley Layden and I'm a professor at the University of Montana where I direct the Energy Technology Program. Before we get started, I want to thank you for spending time with me, Governor Bullock, and the fine folks at the Inspired Classroom and an organization known as We Are Montana in the Classroom who place University of Montana faculty members, graduate students, and professionals in K-12 classrooms statewide to inspire them about higher education and career pathways. Today, with the technology provided by VisionNet, we are able to fulfill this mission. This event is part of a national initiative called STEM Career Accelerator Day, being hosted by STEM Connector. You can find more about their organization at stemconnector.org. My first connection with STEM Connector came through as a result of the National Science Foundation grant I received through their Advanced Technology Education Division to enhance the educational opportunities for my energy technology students, a few of whom you see behind me, to strengthen our relationship with the Blackfeet Community College, to build connections with renewable energy technology companies, and to build connections with high school students around Montana and across the United States. You probably already know this, but the presentation you're about to take part in is a minds-on activity. So get comfortable in your seat, take a deep breath, and get ready to meet and interact with some of Montana's leaders in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Now, I'll hand it over to Governor Bullock, who would like to share with you his vision for the future of STEM education in Big Sky Country. Hi everyone, I'm Governor Steve Bullock, and I'd like to thank you for being a part of the first ever Montana STEM Fest and showing an interest in a career in the fields of science, technology, engineering, and math. These are some of the fastest growing career fields in the nation. In fact, over the next decade, Montana is expected to need more than 2,000 new workers a year with skills specific to these fields. And these are good paying jobs in careers such as engineering, research and technology, architecture, and health sciences. I've been working hard to ensure that students like you have access and support to succeed, which is why we've created the Governor's STEM Scholarship Program to provide financial aid to students pursuing one of these careers. We've also launched the Montana STEM Mentors Initiative to encourage more girls to pursue a career in these fields. You all will determine what the future of Montana looks like, and your participation today means that we will have a bright one. Thanks so much for being here and have a great time. So my name is Frank Rosenzweig. I'm a professor at the University of Montana. I'm in the uh, Division of Biological Sciences and um, I've been here since oh, 2001. I came from University of Florida Medical School where I was a professor of molecular genetics there. And so I've uh, loved my time here in Montana in Big Sky Country, uh, raised my son here and uh, just a great place to be. I have great colleagues and great students coming from Montana. I've had some of the most extraordinary students I've had over the course of my 20 odd years in science uh, right here from uh, this state. Well, howdy folks. Um, my pleasure to be here. Again, uh, my name, you want to do the corner there? Oh, here, I've got to use this okay. guy. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. We have an aborted uh, launch. Uh, <laughs> There oh, we go. There we go. Okay, that's great. Oops. So, here. I'll take it. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully, this will not happen again. All right, so I'm Frank Rosenzweig. I'm from uh, University of Montana, uh, Division of Biological Sciences. Uh, my department is a large and diverse department consisting of about uh, 40 regular tenured faculty and some research faculty. And in particular, I call your attention to the programs we have in cell and molecular biology, organismal biology and ecology, systems ecology. The systems ecology group uh, includes the Flathead Lake Biological Station. And we have something like, you know, 400 uh, majors, maybe more, including the wildlife biology program, which also is associated uh, with DBS. So in terms of my education, um, I've always been into STEM, but I've always been into other things as well, including football, whoever that was over at Sentinel, which is uh, what I, I did for uh, much of my early years. But when I went to the University of Tennessee in Knoxville, I actually was a comparative literature major, 
uh, all the while taking classes in biology and stuff, and uh, but in, enjoying that part of my brain, so to speak. So I worked for a number of years uh, driving trucks and uh, framing houses, which is the kind of thing that <laughs> sometimes you do with a degree in comparative literature, and then decided that I wanted to go back to school, and I went back to school in science, and particularly uh, in biology. So I got into Duke University and did a stint there in their marine biology program at uh, Beaufort, North Carolina, absolutely fantastic place. And then uh, I was lucky enough to get into a, a great school, Ivy League school, UPenn, where I got my PhD uh, in 91 in uh, biology. So what do I teach uh, at the University of Montana? I teach uh, genetics and evolution and eukaryotic genetics. And my research is really driven by this one particular question, uh, what are the ecological and evolutionary forces that lead to increased biocomplexity. And so over the years, my work has been funded by NIH and by, uh, you can take me away from there, <laughs> right. NIH and uh, the Department of Energy, National Science Foundation, recently from the Templeton Foundation. And then over the last several years, I've been funded by NASA. So you might say, well, what in the world is you know, a biologist uh, doing being uh, funded by what I think is like the, the greatest brand on the planet, uh, namely uh, uh, the National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So if you go to NASA Astrobiology or astrobiologynasa.gov, you'll discover the program that funds a lot of the probes that you know, go through the solar system that are going to Mars in search of life on other planets. And this program is also vitally concerned with the new discoveries of exoplanets and how we might uh, look at the chemical uh, composition of the atmosphere of these planets and determine whether or not life as we know it uh, exists. So what is astrobiology, this uh, large program in the NASA portfolio? It's the study of the origin and the evolution, distribution, and future of life in the universe. And so since the Earth is in the universe, it also uh, uh, funds people like me to study the origin and evolution of life on Earth because it is the, the one place where we know that life has emerged. NASA's astrobiology program uh, involves actually a number of different sub-programs that include the NASA Astrobiology Institute, this uh, exobiology and evolutionary biology program that's been funding uh, my work for a number of years, planetary science and technology, a lot of uh, geology and geophysical sciences funded there, habitable worlds, and then Picasso and Matisse are not uh, uh, funding uh, art history projects, but rather these are the two technology development uh, uh, programs that are responsible for uh, designing and manufacturing some of the beautiful instrumentation that's being sent out to uh, other worlds in our uh, solar system. Actually, the astrobiology program is not anything new. In fact, NASA has been funding uh, astrobiological research since the dawn of the space age. So since the earliest satellites were uh, attempted uh, to be sent into uh, Earth's orbit, you've had an astrobiology program because there's been the, the hope, if not the expectation, that someday, somehow, we will discover that we are not alone. So where is this Astrobiology Institute that's part of this larger program? It's actually uh, located in, um, in California at the Ames uh, Research Center in Santa Clara. You can turn, uh, turn me off here, please. <laughs> and I just want to point out that it is a distributed institute. That is to say that it includes a number of different uh, academic institutions as well as some of the NASA uh, partners uh, like uh, JPL, uh, Ames, Goddard, and the SETI Institute. And so there are currently 12 uh, such institutes uh, that are members of the Astrobiology Institute, including MIT, Washington, Southern Cal, Illinois, Riverside Boulder, and here we have one now uh, in Montana, uh, currently associated with the University of Montana uh, in Missoula. So 
when we competed successfully for this, uh, this uh, prestigious award, uh, we, meaning my team and I, took sight of the most common NAI uh, research themes, and most of these, as you might expect, had to do with things like prebiotic chemistry, the origin of life, uh, life in extreme environments, and biosignatures of life that we might find on other planets. So we decided that there perhaps was an unfilled research niche, namely the major evolutionary transitions uh, in life uh, post-cellular evolution of complexity. So just what, what in the tarnation do I mean by that? So the title of our proposal is called Reliving the Past. Okay? Experimental evolution of major transitions in the history of life. And our team consists of a number of investigators. So although it's centered in Montana, we have partners in, at Stanford University, at, at my alma mater, Penn, uh, also at Pittsburgh, uh, and um, uh, also at uh, University of New Mexico and the Santa Fe uh, Research Institute. So, what do you think a major evolutionary transition might be? Well, this is a, this is a concept that was uh, envisioned a number of years ago where a guy named Maynard Smith thought, well, okay, there are certain important events that occurred in the history of life where you went from one to a diversity of units to a number of units that are kind of glued together. And the characteristic features of these transitions is that you go from something very simple to something that's more complex, where you have interdependence and also a degree of autonomy in these associated subunits. And so, there are a number of such transitions if you look at the tree of life, and I think that everybody here that's taken a basic biology class will know exactly what I'm talking about uh, once, uh, uh, once you see this. So here's the tree of life as we envision it now with the three uh, kingdoms, and let's, let's think about these cooperative interactions that have led from simplicity to greater complexity. The invention of metabolism, where you have a number of different proteins working together to carry out a, uh, a series of transformations, is in fact going from some simple subunits to a more complex interacting whole. The invention of organelles, like the mitochondrion, like the, um, uh, the chloroplast, there you have an association of a, of a bacterium presumably with another bacterium uh, leading to more complex life forms. We have in the Earth's biosphere all kinds of different symbioses where you have, say, bacteria that are living in the bodies of animals or living in the bodies of fungi. Um, and both partners benefit, uh, in many cases, from these associations. And, of course, multicellularity. Now, all of these major uh, evolutionary transitions involved microorganisms, because after all, the Earth's history is primarily the history of microbes. So my claim to fame, I wouldn't even say fame, maybe <laughs> notoriety, is to use microorganisms to uh, relive the history of life. That is to say that we can observe uh, evolution in real time by doing experiments in the lab with these microbes that have short generation periods. We can freeze them away so that we can preserve a fossil record of evolutionary change. These things are pretty easy to manipulate genetically. You can rapidly sequence the DNA of these small genomes and even rapidly sequence the DNA of whole populations. So this is the overarching question of the Montana uh, Astrobiology Institute, and that is how have complex networks and associations evolved, and can we sort of recapitulate that using experimental evolution? So we're interested in eukaryotic evolution, symbioses, multicellularity, and metabolism. And here are some of the members of my team uh, from uh, uh, Colorado and Stanford and Pittsburgh and elsewhere. So in the interest of time, I'm just going to tell you about one project and that is, how does multicellularity arise? So if you look outside or look at each other, then you obviously you see multicellular critters, all right? So throughout most of life's history, we only had single-celled uh, entities. 
So I'm going to show you an interesting experiment that was published uh, in Nature about a year and a half ago. It turns out that multicellularity has evolved not once, but many times in the history of life. And you have certain forms that consist solely of, uh, of multicellular, <laughs> there you go, there's the algae, and down here you have animals that are all multicellular, you have other groups like these guys that are all unicellular. So we decided to take a group, this group of uh, uh, algae over here, that where you have the green arrow, a group of algae where you have some forms that are multicellular and some forms that are not. So here's a member of this group, Clamidomonas, which is a uh, unicellular alga, swims around by itself, is never seen in groups. And here you have a closely related organism called Volvox, which is multicellular, differentiated into sexual and non-sexual cells, and yet the genome size of these two is, is uh, actually approximately the same, and they are related in many other uh, different respects. And so the question is, can we evolve in the laboratory something from Chlamydomonas that starts to look like uh, Volvox? And so we did these experiments where we selected for large size, take me out of this yeah. please, <laughs> Uh, to, for large size simply by doing a slow spin of cultures that we successively cu cultivated over time. So a slow spin for a few seconds and then we discard everything at the top of the tube and then resuspend that into another tube and so forth and so on. So we do this for you know several weeks, several months and what do we get out of this? Well we get out an entity which is sort of crudely multicellular. You have a clump of cells that associate with one another preferentially. You might say, well, how do, we, how do you know that's just not, uh, they're not sticking to each other uh, for some other reason that we don't uh, quite understand? And I'm going to show you some interesting movies here. So if you take one of these clusters and you transfer just the cluster into, into a fresh medium, then this is what you get. Uh, soon after the transfer. Now, can you activate that film, please? I will. May please? I use this, please? You may. Thank you. All right, so, boom. All right, so we've just put this guy into the medium, all right? And what you can see is that you have the dispersal of these unicellular forms over the course of this movie, and this thing is progressively growing smaller and smaller and smaller. All right. Next slide. Next slide. There you go. And so, can we go to the next slide? Oh, yes. Uh -huh. Sorry about that. So that's just a repeat. All right. So now let's take one of these single cells that have dispersed and ask, how does it behave uh, once you transfer one of the single cells? And lo and behold, what you see is that they grow again as a cluster, larger and larger and larger. You see some of the others growing into clusters around it, and you're back to the beginning. And so you, you have here this really wild situation where, here, let's go to the next slide, where go. you have a transition from simple or too simple multicellularity from unicellularity, and that this can occur quite rapidly. In fact, it occurred just in a few hundred generations. We also saw something that's characteristic of all multicellular life forms. That is to say, you have an alternation of unicellular and multicellular stages. So you guys are going to undergo a unicellular uh, dispersal phase. You guys are producing sperm cells. Those are unicellular dispersal uh, entities that are representing you out there in the world. And you ladies are producing oocytes that are doing the same thing, single cells, all right? So just about everything out there goes through at some point in its life cycle, if it's a multicellular organism, this alternation of generations. <laughs> all right, so let's get the next bullet point when we're... So these clusters we suggest are units of adaptation because the clusters arise from a single cell just like you did, and therefore uh, the cells within are largely clones of one another. So most of the genetic variation is within the, the cluster and uh, not between clusters. All right, so obviously a few hundred million years ago we did not have centrifuges 
to do uh, experimental evolution on unicells. So we decided to use something else that might su uh, select for large size, and that is, take me out of the picture please, mm -hmm. is that we're now doing experiments with uh, predators, in one case paramecium, in another case uh, rotifers, and we're placing these guys under selection for larger size uh, in the presence of predators. So if you get big, you can't get eaten. All right, It's very simple. So at the top are some of the results of the centrifugation experiments, and at the bottom are some of the examples of the predation experiments. And these predation experiments produce these forms that you see on the bottom. These are the results of three different uh, replicates of experiments with uh, uh, multicellular uh, predators. And so here, this is, this is the, the top panel. Here is the bottom panel bo below. And I would submit to you that the results that we've gotten from some of these predation experiments, in fact, look a lot like described multicellular species out there in nature. All right, so you have, uh, we've shown the evolution of cooperative multicellularity uh, in the laboratory in fairly uh, few numbers of generations. I would like to emphasize that our team is also a cooperative system, uh, just like the Volvox, uh, consisting of people trading students, graduate students. We have meetings, both virtual and actual, um, and the, um, yes and that we have some immediate benefits to NASA in terms of uh, undergraduate assistance. So we have 20 person years of, of uh, undergraduate assistantships uh, at the University of Montana, about the same number at our partners elsewhere. Here are some of the undergraduate fellows that are working in my lab, Emmy, Jacob, Alex, and Maggie. They're carrying out the experiments that I've described to you today. And the Astrobiology Institute is also a cooperative system. We trade students with MIT, USC, Illinois, Riverside, Boulder, and Missoula. All of us are in this game together, and so there are opportunities with the Missoula-based program also to spend summers at some of these other institutes. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention and wish you great success in all of your aspirations. Fantastic. Hello, okay. everybody. Well, I'm going to turn it over to NASA. Okay, thank you. Um, do we want to have them stand up? And... Yeah, let's do that. All right, everybody, stand up. Shake it out a little bit. Come on. Do it. We can see you. Yeah, we can, we can see who's participating and who's not. Okay, so we have, we have a couple of questions that we wanted to ask you before we got started. Um, and so if you know about geology or think that you know what geology is in terms of science subjects, sit down for a second. So sit down if you know about geology. Okay, a couple of you. Yeah. All right. All right, and if... I'm going to go straight to planetary? Yeah. yeah. All right, so... Now, if you've thought about geology in terms of other planets or just generally interested in what we call planetary science, you can also sit down. Okay. We got, like, no one else. Yeah. All right. All right. So for the rest of you standing, let's all sit down. If you've heard of a planet, sit down. Yeah. <laughs> if you've heard of a planet, sit down. Earth, <laughs> Earth is a planet, so let's all sit down. Um, so... Do you want to go first, Christina? I'll introduce yeah, I'll yourself. get us started. Okay. Um, and so I'm Christina Thomas, and I'm here with uh, Lillian Ostrak. And we're both uh, planetary scientists at NASA Goddard. And uh, we're going to tell you a little bit about where we come from, how we got here, and what we work on now. Uh, and hopefully uh, get people a little bit interested in what NASA does, especially in terms of planetary science. And uh, so I'll start off here. And uh, like I said, my name's Christina. I'm initially from uh, Southern California. I tell everyone LA, but it's about an hour outside. Uh, and so uh, we're getting ready for winter here, and I'm completely ill prepared. And uh, as I'm sure you guys are much more prepared than I am. But anyway, uh, so I started out, uh, you know, in public school, uh, studying hard, doing all these things uh, to get into college. I, I went and I did my undergraduate at uh, the California Institute of Technology, uh, where I got a bachelor's in planetary science. And um, after that, I uh, moved across the country to Boston, uh, where I got my PhD in planetary science at uh, MIT. 
And ever since then, I've been hopping around the country. I did a postdoctoral position in Flagstaff, Arizona. And now I am out here. I just completed my second postdoctoral position at NASA Goddard uh, Space Flight Center. And I'm now a research scientist uh, with a bunch of organizations, including the Planetary Science Institute. But my desk is still here at NASA Goddard, so I can collaborate with cool people like Lillian here. Yay. And uh, so that's the, the short version of my story. Um, but for a little bit more detail, uh, you know, ever since I was young, I always thought that planets were amazing. Um, especially coming from LA, you can look up at the sky and see about five stars, and sometimes that star is Jupiter and you have no idea what's going on. Uh, but from, uh, from a young age, uh, someone, I was fortunate enough for someone to actually take out a telescope and show me that that was not uh, just another plane going by. And uh, you see Jupiter and Saturn and look at craters on the moon with these, you know, very small backyard telescopes, and it kind of hooked my interest. And of course, there, there's also the, the popular culture uh, aspect, and so I was a big uh, science fiction fan, especially with Star Wars uh, when I was growing up, and so, uh, you know, kind of putting myself in that nerd box and, and leaning into it, I got really into science and uh, kind of seeing how um, everything would pan out. And I know, especially at the place that you are now, uh, science isn't always exciting. Sometimes it's just copying things out of a textbook and regurgitating them on a test. But I promise it gets better because what you're really doing right now is laying the groundwork for all of the things that come. And um, I think it really paid off in the end uh, to kind of keep on pushing down this path. And uh, so when I went to college, I actually thought I was going to be an astronomer. Uh, you know, a regular, straight-up astronomer. And in some respects, I actually uh, am. But when I realized that most astronomy departments actually didn't do anything with the planets at all, um, I was very, very disappointed. And so I went next door to the geology department, where they had a major in planetary science, uh, which was a focus on astronomy, but using geological things uh, to study the things that are actually in our solar system. And so that's kind of where I, I found the place to really, to really belong, to really kind of uh, set up uh, and study uh, going forward. And I, I always found it very exciting. I ended up studying uh, what I like to call planetary astronomy uh, in that I use a lot of ground-based telescopes to actually observe asteroids, uh, specifically near-Earth asteroids and uh, kind of using both the, the geology tools that I had and the astronomy tools that are out there to come up with this nice interdisciplinary uh, research area. And so I really started that in earnest when I was in graduate school at MIT. Um, I specifically studied how you connect asteroids to meteorites uh, using spectroscopy, so breaking up the light into its component wavelengths and seeing how it changes depending on what the rock is made of. And so we can actually uh, connect that back to samples that we have here on Earth and see how things are similar or dissimilar and uh, try to make uh, big overarching conclusions about where stuff comes from in our solar system and how the solar system formed and, and stuff like that. And of course, it's, it's always more difficult than that and we're still working on a lot of these big questions, but we're taking incremental steps in that direction. And um, so I still find it very exciting. There's always, there's always more to learn. Um, and so, I've been doing a lot of the same over the past several years, uh, but of course one of the very exciting things to do when you uh, study planetary science is to get involved with a lot of the NASA missions. And so especially since I got, came here, I've been really trying to uh, reach out and participate in these things. And so one of them is uh, the upcoming James Webb Space Telescope, uh, which is often touted as the successor to Hubble and I think will be really impressive. It's going to be quite large and should launch uh, in the next couple of years and will really, uh, <laughs> will really advance what we know about astronomy. And so I've been looking at how we can actually look at asteroids with that and what we can learn about asteroids. And so um, I got my fingers crossed that with all of the other people that really want time on this telescope, we'll actually be able to get some asteroid observations in there. Uh, but the other thing that I'm very excited about is the also upcoming uh, NASA mission called OSIRIS-REx, which is a sample return mission to a near-Earth asteroid. And uh, that actually launches next September. Uh, so it's actually coming up on the horizon and everyone's very excited. I'm actually going to a science team meeting tomorrow where I'm sure everybody is going to be almost in a near panic because the spacecraft is almost complete being put together. It is currently in Colorado. and. Uh, Everyone is very, very excited to see their instruments finally put on onto the spacecraft. 
And so Osiris Rex will launch. It will uh, then rendezvous with the asteroid Bennu, where it will take many observations and uh, then collect a sample for return to Earth. And hopefully, if everything goes well and we stay on schedule, that sample will return uh, in late 2023. And so kind of to finish up, uh, I do want to show a short video that NASA produced about the encounter, and I will be telling you a couple of things about OSIRIS-REx as we play that, so we can go ahead and play the video. Cool. All right, uh, so this is a graphic representation of OSIRIS-REx approaching Bennu. And you can see uh, that Bennu will be much larger than the spacecraft, although compared to many asteroids, it's actually going to be quite small. Um, this is a graphic representation of what we think it looks like, but we'll find out later. And you can see here that the field of view of the instruments represented by the colors is actually quite small. And so we're going to get a whole different kind of idea of what the surface looks like compared to our uh, telescopic observations, which gets the whole body at once. And this is what's called the TAG-SAM unit. It's the touch-and-go sample acquisition mechanism. Uh, and it will come out of the side when it's time. And it has a canister at the end that will be used to, to collect the sample. And so OSIRIS-REx will descend very, very slowly to the surface, where it will make contact. It will actually blow a little gust of nitrogen to collect the dust up into the container. And then it will pull away slowly and stow it back into the sample return capsule. And there are actually a number of cameras that will be collecting data on this to make sure that the canister gets stowed correctly and to see how much sample is actually obtained. And once this sample return capsule is actually closed, that means that it is good to go back to Earth because it is actually going to get uh, uh, quite a bit of heat on re-entry. So they have to be very precise with how this is done. Uh, when we get back to Earth's orbit, OSIRIS-REx will release the capsule back to Earth, uh, where it will uh, make a nice fireball across the sky and land hopefully safe and sound in Australia. And so I am looking forward to both uh, the launch and, of course, uh, everything that OSIRIS-REx will do. Uh, but, you know, it's going to be a long eight years now until we get that sample canister back, and I'm very excited. Totally worth the wait. Awesome. Awesome, Christine. I haven't seen that video before. Is that a new one? You know, I actually don't know. They've been improving it as time yeah, goes on. The one that I saw was like a box of <laughs> the asteroid. Um, okay, so um, I guess we can move on to me for a little bit, and then um, the students, you guys can ask us questions and stuff. So my name is Lillian, um, again, and I'm a planetary geologist. I um, got my bachelor's degree in geology and biology at Brown University did a master's degree in geology at Brown University, and then did my PhD in geology at Arizona State University. Is there a theme here? Yeah, there is. <laughs> so um, taking a step uh, to give you a little bit idea about my background, kind of like what Christina talked about, um, I can't really think of a time when I wasn't interested in science. I really um, was encouraged by my parents essentially as early as I can remember, to pursue the topics of um, science and math and art, anything that I liked. Um, and I think it definitely helped that my dad was a scientist. Um, he did neuroscience and then eventually started as a contractor for NASA. Um, and so going to the shuttle launches and other rocket launches in Cape Canaveral, Florida, was definitely a big part of my childhood growing up. Um, so also was catching tadpoles in the drainage ditches and dissecting snakes that we found. Um, yeah, I know it's a little weird. I'm, I'm a little weird. It's okay. I, I own it. Um, and so, so I really, um, I love the outdoors forever. Um, I've always been interested in rocks and and the stars, and I did want to be an astronaut at one point, but then I said, ah, eh, I don't know about that. I kind of like being a homebody, kind of like being with my family and and my dog and all that. So um, when I went to college, I thought I was going to be a biomedical engineer. So I really wanted to help design medical devices that would help sick people. And so I took some classes in engineering, and I also took a couple classes in geology. One of the classes that I first took as a freshman um, was 
the, it was a first year seminar, so open only to 15 first year students, and it was called Exploring Mars. And um, I started college in 2003, in the fall of 2003, just after the Mars Exploration Rovers had launched, and so, or landed on Mars. Um, they launched, I think, about 18 months before. But anyway, um, so I got this amazing exposure into the kind of real-time findings of these um, two rovers, little rovers that could. And so, you know, I thought, well, I don't know, this is pretty exciting too. And I took another class, a basic introduction to planetary geology and also an introduction to astronomy, and I was kind of sold. I was like, ah, that's it. Like, I can go outside, I can do field work, I can look at spacecraft images, be involved in missions, and, and that was it. I went to graduate school and became uh, involved in two active space missions, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter um, mission that's currently in orbit around the moon since 2009, and also the MESSENGER mission, um, which uh, was a spacecraft that flew by Mercury three times before entering orbit in 2011 and impacted into the planet earlier this year. Um, and so, as Christina said, you know, getting involved in active missions at any point in your um, in, in your career, so to speak, as a scientist, is a really great way to make networks, to meet new people, and to be exposed to new things. Um, and so, I definitely got a lot of opportunities. It's one of the reasons that I ended up here at Goddard, because I knew a lot of people here and in this area in Maryland already from working with these missions. Um, so it's definitely sort of, part of it is luck, certainly, because it's the timing. These missions are only happening at, at certain times, and it's being in the right place at the right time. But again, a lot of it is also the hard work and the effort. And so, you know, like Christina said, um, I know how boring it can be to be sitting there memorizing different things. Um, the only geology that I was exposed to um, in middle school and high school was um, like a one one semester earth science course. And um, the thing that I remember most about it was learning about the igneous, sedimentary, and metamorphic rock types, and then also um, we had to create a topographic model of a mountain or something using cardboard, and that, that's pretty much all I remember. And then in high school, I had biology, chemistry, physics. Um, those were the sciences that I had. I also did an anatomy and physiology class um, and got to dissect a, a cat, but that's, you know, not really the geology stuff. Um, so, um, so anyway, um, I, I do want to say in terms of keeping your interest up and seeing, you know, what the point is of, of you know, doing well in science, staying interested in, in your science classes in high school. Um, you know, the thing is, is that there are high school and college internships available at different locations across the country. Here at Goddard, we do have um, an internship program in the summer. I, I don't know if it's, if we have semesters. Um, but, oh, okay, it's all, it's year round. Um, I'm only exposed to interns over the summer when we actually have a fair number of them come in to help us with our work. Um, but, you know, it's high school and, and college internship programs. And, you know, you don't have to necessarily know what you're talking about when you get here. It's just having that interest and having that motivation um, because we teach you what you need to know when you get here. Um, and so that's always an opportunity. There's a lot of opportunities at the local level as well. I got involved um, in different STEM learning activities through volunteering with the high school um, and, and a lot of other things. So the opportunities are out there. And now that you are being exposed to us, you know, you can get our information from your teacher and you know, ask us for questions. I don't know about Christina, but I, I love getting emails from people and, um, and doing stuff like that. So um, I have a couple minutes left, and I want to talk a little bit about some of what I do. So I've got a couple of pictures from the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. Um, so this picture that you see on the screen is the near side of the moon. It should look very familiar to you um, in the sense that when it's full moon, you are actually looking at this exact view. Now this is a bit of a different view than what you would normally see because this, this picture of the near side of the moon is made from a composite number of images that were taken by the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter Wide Angle Camera. It's our, our large field of view camera um, over multiple months. So what we're looking at in this picture actually is the same illumination conditions. So it's kind of the same time of day taken over numerous months because we are in a fixed orbit going about the pole of the moon. 
Um, and so we can have this, this view of, an, of the entire moon like it's, say, um, I don't know, 3 o'clock in the afternoon or something like that. Normally, we wouldn't be able to see it like this because, um, because it's a large surface area and it's a sphere. Um, so anyway, um, I want to bring your attention to kind of the bottom um, the bottom area where you can see there are lots of impact craters. Now, my research focus is planetary surface processes. I do impact cratering, volcanism, erosion. Um, impact craters, I love them. Now, you may or may not be, um, ex be um, knowledgeable about the Tycho impact crater. Tycho is actually visible to the naked eye or um, more easily seen with a pair of binoculars. And it's located down in the kind of center of... Um, of this image. Now, going to the next picture, we're going to actually take a look at the central peak or the mountain inside that impact crater. Now, um, pictures like this one are always, I think, very beautiful, but it's really important, especially to me, because I use all these remote sensing data, um, these pictures, to get a sense of scale. Now, if I told you that that little bitty boulder, that little rock up at the top of that mountain was the size of a baseball stadium, would you believe me? Because it is. That's the size of a baseball stadium. Whereas it looks like, oh, I could just, you know, go pick it, you know, off. And that mountain is two kilometers tall. So that's over 6,000 feet tall. Um, so this is not a tiny mountain, but just looking at this picture, you might think it is. Um, so I, I have to keep a constant reminder of what the scale is all the time. Now, going to the next picture, um, so I'm going to scooch with you, Christina. All right. <laughs> Here, you don't, how about you pass in front of me so I can. Um, so one of the cool things that I get to do um, as a geologist is I get to do field work sometimes. And so um, here we have some pictures from when I was at Meteor Crater as part of the Meteor Crater field camp. So um, in the, when I'm in, on the right, far right side, um, uh, I'm on the rim of the impact crater. So, um, so I'm looking down into this depression that was created by the impacting object that created Meteor Crater. And then in the right, um, I'm actually at the bottom of the crater. And nobody gets to go down there except unless you have special permission. Um, so that's pretty awesome. Um, not many people I know have been able to do that. That is very cool. Yeah, it was, it was really fun. It was really fun. Um, and the next slide, I got to go to Hawaii. Um, and so in this picture right there, I'm holding um, what we call green, the green sand from the green sand beach. Um, it's created by eroding olivine, which is um, a mineral. And it's like the only green sand beach. It's famous. There's signs up there saying, don't take the green sand. Um, I got permission to take a small sample because I'm a geologist. Um, and then there's me goofing off um, with, uh, you can hardly see it, but it's a, a piece of lava that's shaped in a mustache. Um, we have fun. And then these two lower images, um, this image here is um, Mauna Iki, which was a lava lake at one time. So that entire area was filled with lava. And then um, the picture over here is the path, the trail that um, I hiked um, and my friend Jenny right there. Um, we hiked it together just basically all across the plane. I'm trying to go like, do like up, like that. So, um, so yeah, I get to do pretty cool things. And I think Christina doesn't necessarily get to do as cool no. things in terms of the field work, but you get to do cool things with uh, telescopes. Telescopes are pretty awesome, but yeah. that, that, is, that is something else. Yeah. So um, at this point, I guess we'd, we'd be welcome to questions if you've got them. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, we, we're going to, I'm going to also bring, where is he? There he is. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my God. <laughs> There we go. I'm going to bring Dr. Rosenzweig back on. And so if you have questions for either NASA or Dr. Rosenzweig, please go ahead and um, let's go ahead and start. I see, let's see, let's, start. oh, right there. Is that Columbia Falls? Go ahead. Okay. Um, so my first question is for uh, Dr. Rosenzweig. And I was wondering, so you had the two different slides and you had the comparison between um, your artificial evolution and the predation evolution. It looked like yeah. the, and it looked like the predation evolution formed much more natural-looking um, multicellular organisms than the artificial evolution. And so, does this have any effect on like past studies um, and on future studies? Like, is there a big impact from that? A absolutely. So. 
great question. <clears throat> so we have basically two different forms of multicellularity, and we're, we're writing this up now, trying to get down, dig deep into the genetic basis of this. If you think about it, it makes, it makes a lot more sense, you know, to evolve, you know, a big size in response to a, a predator uh, rather than in response to being spun around in a centrifuge. And in fact, if you go and look at the sort of the, uh, the literature that describes what are the selective factors underlying the evolution of multicellularity, predation is always, you know, one of the, you know, one of the big things. <clears throat> so it turns out that um, this unicellular Chlamydomonas, in the course of its natural reproduction, actually goes through very, very briefly a stage where it makes like, you know, four spores, and then it breaks apart and forms these unicellular types. And so it's our hypothesis that this trait uh, which is just a natural uh, feature of its reproductive cycle, is basically captured by the selective pressure of, of, of being grown over and over and over and over again uh, in the presence of predators, so that they, they essentially um, uh, become 8-cell or 16-cell or 32-cell uh, entities, and this becomes a regular feature of their life cycle. And so this is actually, I'm, I'm going to use a 50 cent word here, or 50 cent phrase that in evolutionary biology. It's something called genetic assimilation. And really what it means is that you take, and this is the way nature operates. Nature, at least biological nature, is a big tinkerer. And she takes whatever is available in order to make something uh, better for the particular environment in which she finds herself. And so here's this natural aspect of the biology of the organism that is grabbed and then you, you basically build on that. You modify the, the regulatory pathways that lead to that, uh, you know, that sporulation uh, form and then you expand upon that to create a body that, is, con that consists of many different uh, cells. Now, it remains to be seen how differentiated those cells become over time, but that's that's another experiment. But we're uh, we've actually done some uh, some whole genome sequencing of the ancestor and some of these derived forms, and are actively searching for the genes that are underlying this uh, this genetic assimilation. So great question. Fantastic. Let's go ahead and move. Oh, I'm going to move on to one of our other schools really quickly. What I'm also going to say is that if you have a question that doesn't get answered, if you will email those to to me, I'm Allie, and your teacher has my email address, I will pass them on to both our presenters at NASA and the university, and they will we will get back to you with, with answers to those questions. Um, let's go over to um, Sentinel. Sentinel, do you have a question? No, Sentinel, Sentinel looks, oh, one question, yep. <laughs> maybe not, maybe not. How will we do this? If you have a question, why don't you raise your hand from any of our schools? <laughs> well, these Columbia Falls people, are they're on it. I know, I know it. All right, all right, Columbia Falls, we'll go back to you. <laughs> okay. okay, hello, uh, my name's Anna. And currently, to the best of my knowledge, there's an international space treaty that prohibits the United States from collecting water from Mars. So at this point in time, does NASA have a plan to kind of further the exploration of water on Mars while still falling in the constraints of that treaty? That's a really good question. That's a really Great good question. question. Um, so to my knowledge, no? Oh, oops. Sorry, Mike. Um, to my knowledge, um, that's certainly something that is uh, being considered. But um, there's also part of that treaty is, you know, basically if life is detected or anything that could possibly be life, then you have to back away and like leave it forever. So, yeah. <laughs> right. There are a lot of regulations that are uh, they're held under the Planetary Protection Office yeah. at headquarters. And so it's something that you have to take into account for a lot of different objects. Mars is certainly at the forefront, but they're designing a lot of missions 
uh, to go to other places mm -hmm. like Europa, Europa, where they also have to take this into account. And uh, they had to think about this uh, when designing the end plan for Dawn, uh, which is currently orbiting Ceres, which is one of the very, very large mm -hmm. uh, sort of protoplanet remnants in the asteroid belt. And it's thought to be very water rich as well. And since we think that water might be a place where you get life, they don't want to accidentally contaminate it just in case. And so uh, when it comes time to end that mission, instead of like many others, such as <coughs> Messenger, which actually uh, either collides with or lands on the surface, they're going to pull away um, so that they don't uh, contaminate. And so it's definitely on the forefront of everybody's mind all across the solar system. And yeah. I'm curious to see what happens. <laughs> okay, thank you.